we are now in the 27th lecture of this course and uh, we are focusing on the modeling of the automatic voltage regulator. Just to uh, you know view things in perspective, we have modeled two kinds of power apparatus in this course. One is the synchronous machine itself and also the excitation system which feeds the field voltage to the synchronous machine. Both of these are power apparatus. We know, uh, the dynamical uh, system is also contributed by uh, the excitation system controllers and the primary function of the excitation system controllers which are in fact feedback control systems which are made by us uh, is to regulate the voltage at the terminal of a synchronous machine. Okay. Uh, we saw that uh, if you look at the block diagram of a excitation system controller we also saw that uh, we can implement other functions like uh, improving the stability of uh, you know uh, the electromechanical system. This is something we have not shown yet, but uh, the, the in general an excitation system can also provide for this function and also uh, it can change the field voltage if uh, certain limits are hit. For example, if the field current limit is hit or uh, later on we will see that if the load angle becomes larger okay, or delta becomes larger of the machine, then also you can actually change the field voltage and try to rectify the situation. So, in today's class what we will do is uh, consider certain uh, uh, further uh, transfer function blocks. We were discussing transfer function blo blocks which essentially make up the automatic voltage regulation system in a synchronous uh, generator excitation system. Uh, the transfer function blocks we have considered so far are the simple first order transfer function and also a washout circuit. Both these blocks are very essential and important in the discussion of any uh, practical control system. Remember that uh, we are talking of uh, transfer function block diagrams because you will find that most of the representation of control systems will be in this form. So, if you will open the uh, manual of a synchronous machine in real life you will find that uh, you know the the nature of the AVR etcetera is expressed uh, not in terms of uh, state space equations or differential equations, but in terms of block diagrams. So, we have to interpret uh, the state space relationships or the mathematical functions in terms of what is given to you in a block diagram. Okay. So, today we will continue that. So, today's lecture is a continuation of our discussion of the automatic voltage regulation. We are, we are really looking at a few transfer function blocks. So, the first transfer function block uh, which we will we'll, uh, discuss uh, pertains to the regulator. Okay. Uh, uh, in fact, what we did was in the previous class was in fact a first order transfer function block whose block diagram is represented by the figure uh, given at the bottom and uh, the transfer function represent uh, or rather the state space representation of this is given by this. Okay. So, if somebody gives you 1 upon 1 plus st, you should write it down immediately like this. There is no unique rep state space representation of a transfer function. Also, if you give uh, you are given a transfer function like this, okay, it also means it is a linear system, it is a linear time invariant system. Okay. You can actually add some complexities to the transfer function block diagram which make it linear. For example, uh, non-linear, for example, we could have uh, limiters etcetera which we will discuss shortly. The second transfer function which we discussed last time was in fact uh, a washout circuit. This is in fact a, a system which is represented by the block diagram which is given below. A, the block diagram is kind of expanded, but remember it really uh, the block diagram is a manifestation of the state space equations which are given here on this um, on the sheet. Uh, you will find that there is a minor difference between the block diagram given previously and the block diagram given here. Uh, in terms of its complexity, but uh, the functions can be in some sense opposite of each other. Whereas, the first order transfer function block here has got a characteristics of a low pass filter, the washout block here has got the characteristics of a high pass filter in, in, in the sense that it has got a unity gain for high frequency and uh, a zero gain for low frequencies. Okay. So, it is essentially used in situations where you want to uh, pass through transients, but you want to block uh, you know any offset or steady state input. Okay. Now, the state, state space representation of this block diagram is as given on the sheet here. So, you can have a look at that. 
we derived it in the previous lecture. Again, there is no unique representation, state space representation of this, but this is the most common representation you will find. Okay. The step response of this transfer function is like this. In steady state, if you give a step here, in steady state you will get 0 here eventually. Okay. Whereas, the transient gain is 1. So, as soon as this step occurs, this also responds. Okay. So, in this sense, uh, this particular transfer function is different from the previous one. Of course, these are transfer functions you will encounter, but as I mentioned some time back, uh, the regulator transfer function is usually slightly different. It does contain these blocks sometimes, but uh, the main uh, uh, regulator function of course, is to drive uh, the error be between the set value and the actual value to 0. Okay. So, what are the regulator transfer functions we shall see shortly, but before we do that, we will just look at one more transfer function, which is very important and that is 1 plus s t 1 upon 1 plus s t 2. Okay. Now, this is another transfer function, which you can uh, uh, which you will encounter very often in practice. In fact, if t 1 is greater than t 2, the numerator time constant is greater than the denominator time constant, then it is known as a phase lead compensator. You will find that uh, if you give a input u, which is a sinusoid, then in steady state y, which is also a sinusoid will lead the input u that is if t 1 is greater than t 2. Okay. So, the block diagrammatic representation is of course, given below here. So, this this particular uh, compensator it could be a lead or a lag compensator depending on the relative values of t 1 and t 2 uh, is a transfer function which is encountered quite often in practice. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, the how we got this particular block diagram you just see that the transfer function y of s by u of s is basically 1 upon 1 plus s t 1 upon 1 upon 1 plus s t 2. You can represent this as k 1 okay, plus k 2 upon 1 plus s t 2 and you can easily verify that k 1 is nothing but t 1 by t 2 and k 2 is nothing but t 1 minus t 2 by t 2. Okay. This is the first order block which we have seen already. Okay. So, that is why we get this transfer function which uh, or rather the block diagram uh, block diagrammatic representation in terms of the integrator as shown in this uh, figure. Okay. Now, uh, uh, think about the steady state response of this uh, to a step change if you give a step change to this transfer function 1 plus s t 1 upon 1 plus s t 2, what you will get at the output uh, is depending suppose if t 1 is greater than t 2. Okay. What is the steady state gain of this transfer function? Well, it is very apparent that this transfer function has got a steady state gain of 1. You just put s is equal to 0 here you will get what is known as the steady state gain for a step input. So, if you have got a step unit step in that case uh, your steady state value is equal to the output uh, input. So, the steady state value will be 1. Okay. So, this is a steady state value this time and this is y. Now, the transient value if t 1 is greater than t 2 you will see that for high frequencies, which also define the transfer transient gain, okay, you will find that if you put s is equal to j omega and make j omega tend to infinity, you will find that the gain of this is t 1 by t 2, okay, which is greater than 1. So, what you can expect is if you give a give a step input, if I give a step input, the output will be like this. So, this is 1, this is t 1 by t 2. Okay. On the other hand, in case t 1 is less than t 2, your output will be like this, this is t 1 by t 2. Okay. So, in this case, it is called a lag compensator. Okay. Why it is a lag compensator and why it is uh, why it is a lag compensator when t 1 is less than t 2 is something which you can uh, easily try to find out by looking at the the frequency response of this this i leave it to you okay 
Now, uh, the state space representation of this is quite easy to find out. In fact, uh, if you look at the block diagram which is given on uh, your screen, it is quite easy to derive this. So, what comes before the integrator is your state, okay, uh, the derivative of the state. So, the you can write this as d x by d t is equal to minus 1 by t 2 x minus 1 by t 2 into u. So, this is actually uh, the, trans, uh, the state space, the differential equation. The output is t 1 minus t 2 by t 2 into x, this is minus of it and uh, this is t 1 by t 2 into u. Okay. So, this is what you get uh, as a state space representation. Okay. So, just remember that for every transfer function representation, you can get a state space representation. A state space representation is in, in some sense more rich in the sense that it tells you, uh, uh, you know, uh, the underlying differential equations. It also tells you because uh, looking at the eigenvalues, you can even tell about, tell the time response, okay, what the time response is going to be. Of course, using the transfer function representation itself in the Laplace domain, okay, uh, you can also get the time response depending on uh, the Laplace transform of the input, okay. But working with the state space e equations and differential equations is more convenient. Later on, when we will be doing numerical integration as well as linearized uh, analysis, eigen analysis of the system, it is better to write everything in the state space form. Okay. But uh, typically, uh, what you will be given in uh, most of your manuals and uh, you know worksheets of your uh, synchronous generator excitation system, you will find that it is uh, usually the block diagrams will be in this form okay, using transfer function blocks. Okay. Now, uh, the reason why I have discussed these three uh, important uh, transfer functions. In fact, we have not yet gone come to the main thing that is the regulator transfer function. Usually, most of our controllers including regulators, stabilizers, limiters will be made out of transfer functions of this kind. Okay. The first one is a simple first order uh, transfer function. It is basically a low pass filter kind of characteristic. Washout circuits which allow transients through, but do not allow the steady state to go through because it has got uh, a low gain for low frequencies. This lead lag block on the other hand is something which you can by choosing the appropriate values of T 1 and T 2 get the frequency response of your choice. Okay. Of course, you have only 2 degrees of freedom that is T 1 and T 2 here. Okay. Some of the obvious blocks which you will uh, which I have not discussed uh, explicitly are the gain block. You know you just have a gain a summer, a multiplier, a multiplier is a nonlinear block. Okay. So, it cannot be really uh, you know you cannot form an integrated transfer function in case you have got multiplier blocks anywhere. Okay. Here you do not have multiplier blocks in the three transfer functions which I have uh, the block diagrams which I have shown you here, they have got only summers, gains and integrators. Okay. But you could have under certain circumstances limiters and multipliers coming into the block diagram which uh, make your system nonlinear. Okay. So, the linear part of the system is usually shown with the block diagrams, the transfer function block diagrams and I hope you have got now an idea about what kind of differential equations they represent and in some special cases you know how the they behave as well, the three special transfer functions which I have described to you. The regulator itself will be made out of some of these blocks, but the typical structure of a plane regulator, it could be containing some of the blocks which I have mentioned some time back, but a plane regulator, a plane p i regulator or a proportional integrator regulator has got this kind of transfer function or uh, this kind of representation. Okay. So, this is a p i regulator block diagram in which this is the simplest possible regulator in which in fact, I would not call this the simplest regulator, you can have just a proportional regulator as well. The p i regulator here shown here obtains the error between the set point and the measured value, multiplies it with or gives it a gain of k p. This is uh, 
by mistake it has been written as k i usually the representation k p, k p is a proportional gain. Okay? You also multiply it by an integral gain k i and then integrate it. Okay? Then sum the output of the integrator as well as the proportional gain and get your output y. So, the transfer function representation of a p i controller is the simplest possible p i controller is this. In fact, you can have what are known as p i d derivative controllers as well by adding a derivative block. This is u ref. Okay? So, this is a p i controller. You can also have a p i d controller which in principle is something like this plus k d into s. Okay? This is a derivative. Okay? S denotes a derivative. So, this is again the, uh, the summing junction which sums the, the reference value and the actual measured value. Okay? Of course, if you look at these, uh, trans these components of your uh, block, transfer function block, there is one uh, point which I must make at this point is that usually it is not possible using a causal or a real physically realizable uh, system to make a derivative. Okay? You, you can uh, chew on this on uh, what I have just said. You cannot physically realize a derivative function okay? using causal systems. Okay? So, in such a case a derivative is actually an approximate is approximately realized by using a transfer function of this kind with t very small. So, if you are having transients which are much slower than this t then this behaves almost like a derivative. Okay? Similar this, similarly, this play, a plane gain without any dynamics is often uh, not used. Usually, if you have a plane gain, just a gain here, okay? any noise or distortions in the measured value will get amplified by this gain k. Okay? So, usually instead of just a proportional gain, you will have a proportional gain with a low pass filter kind of first order transfer function. Okay? So, this is what a p i d controller is. This is a p i d. This is a practical p i d controller. Okay? Now, uh, I am not really told you why this is a regulator transfer function. The reason is simply that you take out a difference between the set point and the actual value and you try to amplify it okay? and uh, change the output. So, uh, why is it a regulator? Because if you have for example, in an excitation system, you have got your the voltage regulator, the set point is given by u, it compares it with the actual voltage. Suppose, you have got a p i controller which I said. So, this error is amplified, it is also amplified and integrated in case there is an integral controller and given the output of this is the control signal which is fed to the controlled exciter, uh, controlled rectifier of a excitation power apparatus. That in turn changes the field voltage of the synchronous machine. The synchronous machine field voltage changes the terminal voltage of the machine. So, this is E f d and this is your control signal, we will call it V c. This is how the system works. So, if you have got an amplifier, it tries to change this till this error goes down to 0. Okay? Now, of course, there is a catch here. Should error here become 0 in steady state, if you use a p i controller? The answer is yes. Look at If you look at the block diagram which is given on your screen, note that you have got an integrator at the bottom here. Okay? This is the integrator. Now, if you have got an integrator, what is the job of an integrator? Well, it integrates. Okay? So, it integrates whatever appears at its input here, okay? which is just after the proportion integral gain. So, the thing is that if you want to reach steady state, you should stop integrating. Now, what does that mean? If, I, if you are in steady state, it means that the, the, all the variables reach a steady value. 
Now, if an integrator has got an input which is non-zero, there is no way you will be in steady state because the integrator keeps on integrating whatever is there in the input. So, if you are using a P i regulator, if you are using a P i regulator, in that case, the input to the integrator has to become 0. The input to the integrator is nothing but k i into the error that is u ref minus u measured. Okay? So, it follows that in case you are in steady state and you are using a p i regulator, then the steady state error is 0. So, you can say that if your system is working well, it is stable that is of course, not something which I have proved. The point is that if you have designed your system well, your feedback control system well, it is stable. Then in steady state, if you are using a p i controller and a controller which has got an integral compo component as shown there, in that case the steady state error is driven to 0. Is that okay? So, uh, just to do a quick example, suppose I have got a p i controller say this has got a gain of 100, this is a proportional controller, this is the integral controller. Suppose this gain is 500 and this is added here. You have got an integrator here of the p i controller. So, this is your i channel, the p channel, this is your input, this is u, this is u ref this is u measured. Suppose, the system which you are trying to, this is just an arbitrary system. Okay. Suppose, I have got a system of this kind. This is a p i controller, which is trying to get the output y equal to u ref. Okay. So, this y has to become equal, we want it to become equal to u ref. Okay. So, if you have got a system like this, Okay. You will find that in steady state, this error which appears here, this is the error has been driven to 0. Okay. In steady state. Okay. So, in fact, if u ref is a step input from 0 to 1, in steady state, this error has to be 0. So, this will be 0 if this has to be 0 and this is a feedback system of this kind, y also has to be 1. Okay, y has to be 1. If y has to be 1, can you tell me what is the steady state value out here? Well, it is going to be 1. Remember that the steady state gain of the transfer function 1 upon 1 plus s t is 1. Okay. So, if this is 1, uh, what is the value here? See, this is 0, the error is 0. If you just multiply anything with 0, of course, it is going to be 0 here. So, and this is 1. So, the output of the integrator is 1. The output of the integrator is 1, does it mean that the input has to have a certain value? Well, no. This is the value which the integrator has integrated up to. Okay? The input to the integrator in steady state has to be 0. Otherwise, the integrator will integrate whatever input comes and change this value. Okay. So, this is the steady state values in case you have got step change given to the system of this kind which has got a p i regulator and the thing to be controlled has got a transfer function upon 1 upon 1 plus s t. Okay. In our case, you will have to replace this 1 upon 1 plus s t by the dynamical system corresponding to the excitation power apparatus and the synchronous generator the y is nothing but the terminal voltage. Okay? So, this plant is very simple. In our system, the, the plant which we are trying to control will consist of the excitation system apparatus as well as the synchronous generator. Okay? So, this is just a toy example. In actual practice, for our systems, you will have a complicated plant which has to be controlled. Okay? So, a regulator is you can say trying to control a plant. Okay? Now, so a regulator if you look at it consists typically of a proportional controller or a proportional integral controller or a proportional integral derivative controller. Okay? Uh, if you have got a proportional controller for example, something simple like this. Okay? simply a gain 
and here is the output this is a proportional controller. Okay. So, this is uref and u. Remember you, a regulator is defined as something which is trying to get a measured value equal to the set point value. Okay. So, this is all a regulator. Now, this is a proportional controller. Now, a proportional controller to have any non-zero output, it has to have a non-zero input. So, it follows that if you are using a proportional controller, in that case steady state error between the set point and the thing you want to follow the set point is not 0, is not equal to 0. Why? Because in case you want to have this to have any control signal which is going to affect your excitation apparatus, then this has to be non-zero. Okay? Now, if this gain is very large, then to get a certain control signal in order to obtain the voltage you desire or near the voltage you desire, in that case the error need not be too large. So, if I use a larger gain in a proportional controller, then the steady state error is going to be lower, because to get the same value of the excitation required to get a certain value of u, you require a smaller value of error. Okay? So, in a proportional controller steady state error is not equal to 0, but a high gain proportional controller will have lower corresponding steady state error. Okay? Now, as in any control system design, it is not guaranteed that your system is going to be stable for any kind of gain. Okay? So, you actually have to do a control system design in order to ensure that your system is stable under uh, various uh, situations. In fact, uh, we have uh, I am sure you have done a course on control system design sometime in your previous um, in the previous years. Now, this particular system which I showed you which is shown here on the sheet is in fact uh, it you can show that it is going to be stable. Okay, if t is not greater than 0, then you can show that this particular system is stable or unity feedback system is stable for any value of p and i. Okay. So, we have we can uh, have a system of this kind which is stable. Okay. Uh, you can just verify this okay, that uh, at least if I got just a proportional controller, it is easy to show that the system is always stable. Okay. So, this is something you can just check out. Okay. Is it proportion is it stable with just a proportional controller, is it stable with a proportional integral controller and what are the gains for which it is it is going to be stable in terms of this cap, uh, this time constant t. Okay, so this is a separate, uh, you know, subject of control system design, uh, which is related to power system dynamics. If you are going to do power system dynamics, you should know a bit about uh, a little bit, or at least about control system design and stability. Remember that just using a proportional controller or a proportional integral controller is sometimes not adequate. Okay that in that context you may actually have to use uh, the transfer functions which I have discussed before. For example, instead of a plain proportional integral controller, you may not get a stable performance. Okay? So, you may have to add a lead block or a lag block in order to improve the performance of the p or p i controller which you will use. Okay? So, this is one thing which you may see in a you know a control system that in addition to the proportional or proportional integral controller, you also have these blocks which try to improve the response. What do I mean by improved response? Well, one of the things you should ensure with your regulator is that if for example, I give a step change, this is one way to specify the performance of a regulator. If I give a step change, how much time does u require to settle down? Okay? So, u is actually determined by a fairly complex processes. Remember that for a AVR, this will the output of this is the control signal to the excitation apparatus. The excitation apparatus itself may have very significant dynamics as we see in a brushless excitation system. Then that determines the field voltage. The field voltage again a field voltage change results in a terminal voltage change of the synchronous generator in a fairly complicated way, because you will have to actually solve all the differential equations either numerically or if we linearize it around an operating point, you can even do a linearized kind of analysis. 
what I want to say is that eventually the u the you know automatic voltage regulator is going to be determined by a fairly complicated set of dynamical processes. Okay. So, eventually your response is going to be something like this, it could be something like this. So, for a step change if you look at this, for a step change in the input you could have for example, so if this is your voltage reference your actual V could be like this. Now, obviously, you should design your system so that it settles fast if a system settles down fast it also means that the modes which are observable in the voltage are more stable they are more having real parts which are more on the left hand side of the of the complex plane and as a result of which they decay very fast okay you also would like your rise time okay to be fast you don't want it to rise like this okay the best possible response could be something like this you want it to rise and settle down immediately okay so that kind of response you could want in the case of a excitation system remember that the conditions of the synchronous generator whether it's open circuited on no load or it is at half load or at full load will really change the kind of response you will get the plant of the system which is the excitation exciter power apparatus as well as the synchronous generator and the power system to which it is connected will really determine the response. So, you, what you need to do when you are trying to design a system is to use not only proportional integral controllers, but you may require to use a lead lead or a lag block in series with the proportional controllers in order to get some degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom are in fact, the time constants T A and T B of the lead or lag compensator you get these degrees of freedom in order to improve the response. Okay. So, this is what is very important which you should note. So, if you look at a typical regulator it is not just consisting of proportional controllers typically you will find that it is consisting of V ref V a lead or a lag block lead or a lag block usually you know depending on the situation you could use most likely you will use a lag block if you want to achieve some functionality. And a PI controller in often you will find it is just a high gain proportional controller integral component is absent in many in many kinds of AVRs. Okay. So, this is what you will normally see you may sometimes uh, I will just redraw this. What you will normally see is this is the summing junction, of course. Then you have got a lead or a lag block. You could have a cascade of these, you could have another, for example, if you require it, if your time response has to be further tuned. Then you have got a PI controller, but usually a high gain. P controller suffices. Okay, so th it has uh, the system will have a steady state error here, but uh, if it's a high enough gain, the steady state error will be negligible. Okay, so this is usually what your uh, AVR is going to look like. This is the control system. Now sometimes it may not be adequate to get uh, to get a very good response just with these blocks. Okay, so in some some AVRs what you will find is that the excitation system is connected to this of course, the synchronous generator the field current is taken as a feedback the field current is taken as a feedback and you have got this additional block. of this kind which is fed into this summing junction here. Okay. So, you may have another block like this which takes a feedback of the field current okay, of the synchronous machine. In a brushless excitation system we may not be able to get the field current of the main generator, but you may be able to get it of the excitation system alternator. So, in some cases you may take input from this point. Okay. Now, 
this this may be an extra block which may be present in certain excitation systems certain avrs to improve the you know the stability of this control system okay so this is often called an excitation system stabilizer remember it has got a, a transfer function which is skf upon 1 plus stf so this is essentially like a washout block okay with a slightly different gain of course the steady state gain of this uh, would be kf okay so this uh, sorry this the transient gain would be kf and the steady state gain is zero okay now one of the things you should remember though this excitation system similar is being fed into this summing junction its output in steady state is going to be zero so the output in steady state is going to be zero so it will not interfere with the regulation function out here okay so in steady state this will be 0. So, v will try to be driven to be v ref okay, by this controller. Okay. So, this does not contribute anything at the summing junction. If something gets, if something non-zero is contributed at the summing junction, then the regulation function will get compromised. Okay. But this is not the case because in steady state, the output of this is 0. So, you may find, we will not actually go into the design of the AVR itself, but you may find blocks like this in addition to the regulator, the basic regulator which is a proportional controller. Okay. So, this is what uh, our controllers typically look like. There is another uh, block which I need to discuss at this point. We have already kind of got a flavor of that block before that is the limiter. Now, we have uh, without much spending too much time, if you recall this was the uh, kind of uh, you know symbolic representation of a limiter which was given. So, if you have got an input u, it will get clipped to the values specified here. So, if I specify this value as plus 1 and minus 1, in that case this in suppose you have got an uh, output y dash, y will not be equal to y dash if y dash exceeds these limits, it will just get clipped at that limit. This is often called what is known as a soft limiter. In fact, we have used the limiter to model the converter static converter which is uh, used in the excitation power apparatus okay now this is simply a clipper okay it simply clips the output so if you find you have got something like this this is simply clipping the output which appears here but remember it does not affect it does not affect the output y dash. Okay. So, it allows y dash to get, get any value you want, but it clips the value of y dash in order to get y. Okay. So, this is this is a soft limiter. Okay. You can have another class of limiters which is called a hard limiter. In order to do that, let us take the example of a simple integrator. Suppose, I have got an integrator. and I try to limit it. Okay. This is a soft limit. Okay. So, if you got an input u, it will be integrated in order to get y dash, y will be the clipped value of y dash. Of course, if y dash does not exceed any of the limits specified here, okay. for example, plus 1 or minus 1, this is an example of a limit. In, in that case, y dash is equal to y. So, only when the limit is exceeded that these limiters come into play. Okay. A limiter makes the system non-linear. Okay. So, although our transfer function representations etcetera are actually of linear time invariant systems, when you have limiters included in the transfer function blocks, effectively your system becomes non-linear. Okay. So, let us now look at another kind of limiter. It is represented in this fashion. The difference between these two limiters this limiter and this limiter is that in case the output y exceeds the limit or tends to exceed the limit, the integrator stops integrating. So, just try to chew on this statement. The integrator stops integrating in case the limits are ex exceeded. Here, the integrator does not stop integrating, it keeps integrating. The output simply gets clipped. Okay, so, y dash and y need not be equal and the output gets clipped. Here, if y dash exceeds 
the limit specified here say plus 1 and minus 1 say this could be anything. In that case the integrator simply stops limiting in some sense you can say that it inti starts integrating 0 instead of u. Okay. It starts integrating again when there is a chance that the limit the, the output y can come out of its limit. So, if you for example, if the output is at plus 1 which is the limit specified here then this integrator stops integrating till u starts becoming negative and there is a chance for this y to come out okay, or start coming out of the limit. You can uh, take say an example of a simple system like this. Okay. So, if I have got an integrator and I am trying to integrate um, input u, say u is cos omega t. Okay. So, let us assume that this integration has been going on for a while, I will just show it this way. Suppose, u is cos omega t. Okay. Then of course, the output y would be, so if, uh, if we have got input as omega into cos omega t okay, and you try to integrate it, you will get sin omega t. Okay. So, omega into cos omega t suppose is this will eventually get sin omega t is something like this. Yeah. So, this is your sin omega t, this is your output y. Okay. Now, suppose I have got a soft limit okay, which is put at plus 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5. In that case, the output would be clipped. So, what you will get in fact at y is not this. something which is clipped at 0 0.5, plus 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5. So, this is the response of a soft limiter. Okay. So, it just clips the output. So, what you will get at the output is what is in black that is this, I will just darken it a bit so that you can see it. So, what you see is the integrator does integrate okay, as per its rule. So, the red curve is what you get simply by integrating omega cos omega t. Okay. But what you get at the output is a clipped version of this. Okay. The integration operation itself is not affected. Now, if you on the other hand try to integrate by a using uh, in the presence of a hard limiter, So, you have uh, okay, it is not very much well drawn, but anyway. So, this is cause. Uh, so, if you look at how this particular system behaves, you will see that it integrates up to 0 0.5. This is actually will not meet at 0 0.5, but anyway, it will integrate up to 0 0.5. Okay. After that, it gets limited. Now, it will go on staying at the limit. Okay. So, what happens is that the integrator itself stops integrating. It is not that the integration is going on. At this point, we do not continue with the integration. We stop the integration and the, the output remains at this value. This is exactly as we got before, but whenever the integrand this is u the input becomes negative there is a chance of coming out of a limit okay because if you integrate a negative quantity then you start decreasing from where you are so what will happen is you will come out of the limit right away okay so this is uh, this is what happens in case you have got a hard limit in fact if you have got a soft limit it's this and a hard limit it's this so whenever you have got an integrator which is hard limited you will find that uh, it stops integrating as soon as the hand limit is it. In fact, this is desirable under certain circumstances. In this earlier circumstances, circumstance with the soft limit, what happens is the integrator goes on integrating and you may really go on although your output is being clipped, the integration here is co continuing and you may find it, it is taking much longer time to come out of its limit even though 
the input u has got become negative okay, in this case. So, the input u has become negative at this point, but it comes out of the limit only at this point. Whereas, here with the hard limiter at this instance itself the integration resumes, because there is a tendency to reduce the value, because u has become negative. Okay. So, this is what is known as a limiter. So, you will find that most control systems will, uh, will be designed with limiters in order to prevent. See, what happens if your, you know, your limit has been reached? You do not want to go on making the controller trying to do something. Anyway, it is not getting implemented. Okay. So, it is a good idea to put limiters uh, uh, wherever wherever feasible and wherever it is reasonable to do so. So, you will find typically have a limiter here on the hard limiter on the integrator and a soft limiter here which will clip the output as well. Okay. Of course, if you are just an integral controller you do, uh, which is hard limited you do not have to put a soft limiter again, okay. but here since you have a combination of p and i you can have a hard limiter as well as a soft limiter. So, on the whole you will prevent the values from going out of range. Okay. So, this is what uh, typically you will find in your uh, AVR controllers. Now, suppose we want to uh, take up now a simulation of, of automatic voltage regulator. We have actually discussed uh, the way control systems are, okay, typical control systems associated with uh, the regulator are. We of course, not discussed about limiters etcetera. Uh, right now, we will focus on the regulator itself, regulating function itself. Remember that V ref uh, of the synchronous uh, of this AVR can be modified by limiters and stabilizing functions okay, whenever there is a need to do so. Okay. So, for example, if the synchronous machine uh, field uh, current is exceeded, you may wish to sacrifice the regulation function, but reduce the field voltage. So, as to reduce the field current. Okay. So, if some equipment limit is being hit, then the limiter may wish to reduce the field voltage uh, instead of carrying on with the regulation uh, function. So, in some sense the V ref objective, the objective of being making V as close to V, v ref as possible is compromised and uh, you would rather maintain limits. Okay. Uh, we saw that uh, if you want to improve the dynamics of one or more uh, modes of the system, you may actually put in stabilizing functions. One of the functions we saw was an excitation system stabilizer, but um, the main characteristic of a stabilizer is that its output in steady state is 0. Okay. Now, we will move on to uh, trying to simulate uh, an automatic voltage regulation system along with a AVR. So, if you really look at what is involved, you have got the mathematical functions or the state space representation which describe how an AVR works. Okay. So, AVR of course, will require you to have a set point which is given. Okay. It takes the feedback of voltage, okay, the terminal voltage of a generator. The excitation system gives the control signal to the excitation power apparatus that gives the field voltage to the synchronous machine. The synchronous machine output is of, of course, what you measure using a potential transformer which is fed to the AVR. Remember the AVR is not a power apparatus, it is a control system. Okay. The AVR itself may take feedback signals like the field current. Okay. So, this is a typical uh, structure of the system. We will what we will do in this the next class is try to analyze a system of this kind. So, what we will the simplest thing we can do is suppose we take a static excitation system. So, if you have got a static exciter as shown in the screen on the screen, then the converter model is usually a static one and the only thing which you need to represent is the field voltage limits, the limits of the converter itself I am sorry the field uh, the limits of the converter are determined by the terminal voltage of the generator itself because the power apparatus of the excitation system is fed from the terminal voltage of the synchronous machine itself okay so if you look at this it's fed from the terminal voltage of the synchronous machine so the limits 
are effectively decided by the terminal voltage of the synchronous machine. Okay. So, the converter itself we will assume that it is a static model, it is a simple model in the sense that it implements whatever the control system tells it to do subject to the limit. So, if I want, so we will kind of have let us say we will just model it this way, this is the terminal voltage of the synchronous machine these are the limits imposed on the converter output by the terminal voltage of the synchronous machine. This is the field voltage. Okay. Let us assume that this field voltage is in per unit. We have defined the per unit system before. E f d is 1 if it results in an open circuit line to line voltage for a star connected synchronous generator at a uh, rated speed. Okay. Uh, so, it develops the rated voltage at the rated speed then we call that voltage as 1 per unit. Okay. So, we will not represent it in volts, but in per unit. Okay. Now, the control signal which gives this E f d okay, again can be expressed in terms of volts, it is a signal okay, which is given to this converter, but if I say that 1 per unit of let us define or normalize our control signal in such a way that 1 per unit here a control signal of 1 per unit results in 1 per unit E f d then the gain of the converter becomes 1. So, this is also represented in per unit. Okay. The AVR, this is the excitation apparatus. Okay. The AVR, let us assume, is a simple proportional controller of this kind. This is the error signal, this is V ref, this is V. So, this is what is your AVR and power excitation system block diagram. Okay. K A is typically you know it could be say around 200 to 300 or even 400 per unit by per unit. The gains are in per unit. So, what I will do is I will also do this sum. So, all these gains etcetera are expressed all in per unit. So, I have already described what this per unit system means okay. as far as the field voltage, the control signal. The terminal voltage is expressed in per unit on the generator terminal voltage base okay. that is the rated K V of the synchronous machine. So, if I represent it this way, then K is typically of this value. Okay. It could be say 200 or 300 or 400. Okay. It is usually kept quite high. So, that to get a value say of E f d 1 here, you the amount of steady state error required here is very small. Okay. Remember that the, the, now this T a is usually very small, this is of the order of 1 cycle that is all say 20 milliseconds. So, this is the block diagram of excitation system uh, with just the regulator included. We could have included many more possibilities. In fact, in this course, we will not do that. We will include a simple excitation system model. Okay, using a static uh, exciter okay. and this we will use to study the voltage regulation of a synchronous machine. What I will do is now incorporate these the equations which are uh, you know embodied in this transfer function uh, or these limitation limiter and summer blocks write them as state space equations okay. interface them with the synchronous generator equations connect a synchronous machine to another voltage source. Okay and try to regulate the terminal voltage of the synchronous machine. We will do one more, one extra thing, we will not connect the synchronous machine directly to a voltage source, we will connect it via a model of a transmission line, a very simple model of a transmission line. Modeling of a transmission line is something we will do in brief later in this course, we will just take a simple model when we are studying this. So, with this uh, we will come to the end of this lecture, in the next lecture stay on for the incorporation of an AVR into uh, the synchronous machine equations uh, and uh, the simulation of uh, the voltage regulation action.